Hey, Tiny. Hi. Oh. Bruce. Bruce. <laughs> hey, Brucey. <laughs> this is Bruce. He's new here. Bruce was born in my friend Nora's doghouse. She lives out in the country a lot like we do and just a cat that is not her cat came and had kittens in her doghouse and she was looking for homes for them and I'd seen her post on Facebook. Uh, I'd asked Jeremiah, hey, what about these kittens like when they were first born? He'd said, yeah, sure, get one. And I was like, actually, no, I don't wanna have three cats. And then uh, Kit and George passed away right after that. So I waited a couple weeks and then ended up messaging her and saying, do you have any more of those kittens? And she had one left. So we went and picked him up and uh, named him Bruce. He is gonna be inside. So he's uh, learning, he's, he's a little bit slightly, I guess slightly feral, but they handled them a lot. I don't know, he's kind of in between. I think he'll be, I think he'll be a good cat for us. And he, I don't know, we're having a lot of fun with him. He spends most of his time asleep on Jackson's bed. Hey girl, hey Katie, hey little guys. Look at all these ladies. Nigerian dwarves are so chatty. Hey, hey Janice, Regina, oh yeah. Hey Mabel, here's little Fred. He's getting so big. He's a sweet boy. Look at that. Oh, kissing mama. Mabel, Fred's mom, is the daughter of a goat that I had, one of my first goats, Pesky. And Pesky was so, so sweet, but she was really difficult to milk because she wouldn't let her milk down. And I've been kind of unsure on what Mabel was going to be like. The thing is, Mabel was dam raised and She's kind of wild, like she just hasn't been handled a lot. And since that first set of kids, which Mabel was part of, that were born on our farm and we realized how uh, difficult it is to like medicate and trim hooves of goats that haven't been handled by people very much, we have become super intentional. Like now we handle our baby goats so much that they let us pick them up at will because we come out and spend lots of time with them so they're really used to being snuggled and loved on because it makes taking care of them way easier. Mabel, that's just not the case with her. And so I've been dreading starting to milk Mabel. I've been thinking that this whole stand training thing was gonna be a total nightmare. Jeremiah put her on the stand for the first time like a week and a half ago, a few days after Fred was born. I mean, we fed her on the stand and stuff, but this is the first time we were gonna be handling her udder. And she stands like an angel. Seriously, I couldn't believe it. Didn't fight, didn't kick. I mean, jumped right up on the stand, let us milk her out, made lots of milk. Now we haven't separated him at night yet because he's not quite old enough. But what a relief. Mabel, you are awesome. Oh, and there's my poop eating dog back there. Great, Bear, thanks for that. Bear, stop, that's gross. You kiss your mother with that mouth? So we're handling this guy quite a lot to make sure that he is not wild like his mom was. Like these guys come right up for some lovin's. Hey, hey. I'm just so relieved and thankful. So he's, he's getting close to two weeks old now, and when he's two weeks, we'll start separating him with the other kids at night and milking Mabel every morning. Maya started this project yesterday. He's putting a gate in here that connects the goat yard to this field so we can let the alpaca girlies and the big goats through here so we can kind of let these herds run together and easily put them into our backyard because we don't mow that yard We just let the goats eat the grass down and right now it's difficult to get them there because we have to lead them through the front yard What are you doing? What are you doing Karen? Do you need to speak to a manager? I've already got a little growth on my sun chokes back here in the sun choke bed
Hey, I'm finally seeing some new growth on the sweet potatoes. Now, if you see out here in the woods, y'all see the hammocks out there. Maya set those hammocks up for the boys out there. And Ben, Toby, and Ezra keep saying, you know, oh, we're gonna go hammocking in the woods. And they, they just go out there and they lay in these hammocks. It's so funny. And this morning I got out here after everybody else. I don't know, I was probably like eight something this morning. And I had a cup of coffee and I walked out here and the boys are all out there laying in their hammocks and they're laughing and talking. And I couldn't hear exactly what they were saying. And I turned around here and it was just like the bright morning light and I had my coffee, they're laughing, it's all this joy. And I see this and I just had a moment. It was definitely one of those moments that was, I don't know, really impactful and just kind of taking it all in. This is very uh, breathtaking to see. This thing is massive. Here's the view from my sitting stump. I am a surprisingly not visual person as far as like really being able to like see things kind of you know I mean I can draw things out and visualize in like a planning sense but the actuality of things usually takes me by surprise Maya's not like that like he's really visual and so whenever thing you know whenever things come into fruition he's always like okay it's what he expected but I don't know, coming up on this high tunnel and just how big it is, the high side walls, I mean, it's, it's impressive. It's a really large structure. And I think the magnitude of this just kind of like gripped me a bit this morning. It was, it was a really cool moment for me. I will remember that for a long time. Look at that majestic dude. Manny. So did you have a bearing on how big this was gonna be? I don't think so. Really? Because I was just telling them you're usually better at visualizing things than me. Oh, uh, I just had this mental picture in like the other high tunnels I've been in, but they're not high sidewall. Yeah. And so they're big, but not this high. Yeah. Like when we put the bows in, I looked at Ben and I was like, ah, uh, how are we supposed to get up there? I'm going to attach this stuff. Like honestly, I, I haven't even figured out yet how we're going to get the plastic over this thing. <laughs> I really don't, no. <laughs> so we'll figure it out. I keep accidentally calling this a greenhouse. It's technically, it's called a high tunnel. I'm trying to check that language so it's not confusing. This is a ton of growing space. Um, this is about 1,500 square feet. That is almost as big as the whole top floor of our house where like all, like our main living area, kitchen, bedrooms, bathrooms, like 1,500 square feet. That's a, that's a big space, like this is house sized. We chose the high side wall, high tunnel from Grower Solutions. Uh, the reason we did that is because we do live in an area that has very hot summers. And so without being able to properly ventilate this, it would not be feasible for us to try to grow in it throughout the summer. We need to be able to have airflow. It will also have fans on the top of the front side, the front wall, as well as the back, the end walls. So that way we can ventilate it and grow. A few questions have been coming up about the high tunnel. And uh, basically like we're, we're doing a very similar style of gardening in here as we do in our front garden beds. I'm doing cattle panel walls to do my uh, tomatoes on. I'll still be pruning those down to a single stem. I have started to kind of look into some like more traditional greenhouse growing methods like and using like the tomahooks which are the things that you can trellis the tomatoes up and i've decided that since one we're we're starting this kind of late in the season uh right now i've got my all my tomatoes and stuff planted in the front beds and this will have it planted within the next two weeks so it's not terribly late uh, it's a it's completely okay but i'm kind of hesitant to try to change a lot of things and try to learn a lot of new factors. Like for me, it feels more logical for the way that I process things to do what I do outside the high tunnel, inside the high tunnel. And then if for some reason I don't like that and I wanna try something new, then I'll change something else next year. But I feel like if I change a whole bunch at once, I won't really be learning in a way that I can really know what I actually like and don't like. I hope that makes sense. The idea is to do the tomato walls in here 
And so for one raised bed, I'll have, you know, I'll have a row that's tomatoes growing on a cattle panel. And then I'll have the whole other side of the bed to grow other things. And I'm planning on putting a lot of peppers in this greenhouse because they like the heat. And uh, I really appreciate the suggestions you guys are giving me about things that I should grow. I had completely forgotten about roselle, which is something that I definitely want to grow for the purposes of making tea. And I have the seeds for that. It's just had slipped through my mind whenever I had, was planting. So I'm, I'm loving the suggestions and I'm still devising my plan. I'm, I think my plan will probably come together as I start putting things in the beds back here. Sometimes we will come up with a plan of what we're going to do and we'll get into it and go, wait a second, I see a problem and we'll kind of have to maneuver and kind of ran into something like that and how we planned to use this during the summer months and we've adjusted, which is fine, but let me show you kind of what our problem is. I think it's still okay. I think it's just gonna be a, another step in the fall to take it down, but it is what it is at this point. Now we made these beds by the walls of the high tunnel, and these are 60 feet long. And then we have the shorter beds in the middle that you can get through and around. And the plan was to run four cattle panels in this bed from one end all the way to the other and grow tomatoes on that and then grow something else on the inside. The issue that I considered with that after the fact, which I mean, I don't know that we would have done anything different. I feel like we're definitely making the most uh, out of this space with planting space, the way we've done this. I mean, we, we fit a lot of beds in here, but high side walls for ventilation, if we put walls of cattle panels covered in tomatoes along this wall, ventilation is kind of an issue with that. Like we're basically using our high side wall, high tunnel, and putting walls of tomatoes in place of the walls of plastic, which on the beginning end of the season wouldn't matter because they wouldn't be very big, but towards the end of the season, if those tomatoes grow up a whole lot, it would be problematic. What we are going to do instead is, is run the cattle panel wall on the inside, and through the summer season, these will always be open, and so we'll be able to access this side of the bed from the outside and then when the weather begins to cool off and we need to roll these down uh, sh it'll be about the time that we start pulling the tomatoes out and uh, we'll take the cattle panels down to grow through the winter. One of the things that's very freeing to me with this is this is new I've never done it before uh, there's going to be some process and learning and I don't expect to get everything right the first year that I do this. And so like in the situation, like where do we put these walls of tomatoes? We might not even put a wall up in the other bed. I might decide not to grow any tomatoes in that at all. Like I have the freedom to figure that out, um, to try things, to move them around. I, I like suggestions because it might show me an angle that I hadn't thought of before. I think that's what we're gonna do. Definitely gonna put some trellises up in these, these inside beds as well because of the fact that this is gonna keep the moisture off of the plants. I really wanna maximize the space for tomatoes because my hope this year is to grow enough and can enough tomatoes that I don't have to buy like spaghetti sauce or salsa for the entire year. We have a big family. That's a lot of tomatoes. Look at my sunflowers all coming up and looking lovely. These are gonna be so huge in no time. This garden's looking good. Painting this is quickly approaching on my to-do list. I have some ideas in mind. It's gonna be really pretty. Check this out. My factory girls are looking so much better. Look at them. It's almost getting hard to tell them apart from the production reds we already had. Some of them are really starting to fill out. Isn't that so good? I'm a total sucker for a good animal rehab story. Uh, just whenever animals get a happily ever after, especially ones that had a sad life the way that these chickens do. I don't know, it just makes me happy. I, my first job was when I was 12, I volunteered at the local animal shelter in the town that I grew up in. 
and my little best friend and I would walk down to the animal shelter and you had to be 12 to volunteer and we waited and waited and waited and as soon as we turned 12 we would walk down there of course it's different time where kids could do stuff like this safely but we, we would walk to the animal shelter and spend every day after school there working on like cleaning kennels and brushing dogs and you know taking them for walks and all that stuff for years until I was 14 for two years and there there were periods of that time especially like during the summer and my parents would drop us off in the mornings we would spend eight hours there a day we loved working there and I, I've always been like a total animal lover I mean I guess that probably shows but I think that was probably when that whole love for a good rehab story thing was really really birthed in my heart and since then I've always loved that for even I mean in recent years I've gone and like taken photos of dogs at animal shelters so they could get adopted and stuff like that I did that a lot when I had my photography business it was one of the things that I would do and I don't know it's just it's really cool to me because animals are really precious and I just have always felt like whenever they're rescued they know it I just feel like rescued animals have a gratitude about them that's really cool and here is my first broody hen of the year. I haven't fully decided what I'm gonna do with this little lady just yet. Broody hens are great to have on a homestead. If you're going for sustainability, you specifically want to have some breeds of birds that are prone to broodiness because that guarantees your next generation of chickens. It takes out the work of incubating and brooding and it means that if, as long as you have a rooster and you have hens laying eggs, if you have a broody hen, you can have more chicks on your farm without having to pay for them. I get asked sometimes like what's better, allowing a broody mom to raise chicks or doing it yourself. And there are so many factors that go into that. If you have a place to like isolate her where she can raise her chicks and really make sure that they're safe, I would say that that is probably the superior way. I think that they probably learn their chicken instincts a little better that way. As far as like if you're just gonna let her hatch out some chicks and raise them with a the general flock, you'll probably end up losing some. That's just uh, the nature of it. Not always, it's not always the case, but it definitely can happen that way. The issue that I'm having right now is that we got a bunch of new chicks this year from Murray McMurray Hatchery, and I really don't need any more chicks. However, I really like the fact that this hen is broody. I want to encourage her to raise some babies because I like having hens that go broody for this purpose. If I had day old chicks that I could stick underneath her, I would totally do that and just give her a couple of babies to raise, but the chicks we have are way too big for that. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to decide, she's still sitting right now. You can break them of this by putting them in a wire bottom cage or crate uh, for a few days where they basically can't sit on a nest uh, that keeps their underside cool. And after a while, they'll stop trying to sit. I had this one hen, her name was Mama. That's what we called her, very cool original considering uh, what I'm about to tell you but she was always broody she was such she was a fierce fierce mother hen and she raised so many chicks for me I actually had to break her of broodiness sometimes and like isolate her in a cage because when they go broody they put everything into it like they will hardly get up to eat a lot of times they'll actually lose weight and it can be bad for them to be broody all the time but you have certain hens that just do that and mama was worth her weight in gold because the whole time that I was doing like the egg color breeding and I was breeding for darker eggs I didn't have to fire up the incubator every single time I got a few really dark brown eggs that I wanted to hatch or a few really nice green eggs that I wanted to hatch because with her and a couple others that I had that were broody often I always had a hen that would follow through and actually hatch and raise the chicks that I could put those eggs under and that's really really valuable even if you have an incubator a broody hen is a good thing to have around however they're mean mean <laughs> well she might not be that mean after all I fully expected her to peck at the camera she might be a good broody to have around. 
Nope, too nervous, I'm not touching her. Some broody hens don't play, they'll draw blood. Don't mess with a mother. Life lessons from the hen house, right girlies? Right. Come on, you poop eater. You nasty. I noticed the grass was starting to grow back here with the boys. I just looked up here the other day and saw the green and thought, well that's cool. They have some grassy areas, but they're just making a slower comeback this spring. Uh, other places of the farm are, are growing quicker than these. I'm not walking over there because I really don't have shoes on to go out into the woods. But Thor and Oakenshield has turned into an awesome goat. If you'll see, he's almost as big as uh, Manny the alpaca. He's huge and so sweet. Like he lets us pet on him and stuff. He's not at all aggressive. He's not like a back pocket goat. There's kind of a fine line you wanna walk with big bucks like that because if they're too personal, it can be a problem because when you have a 200 pound animal that just wants to like lean up on you and get get on you it can be way too much he likes his space he'll let us pet on him he comes up to him when it us when it's time to be fed but for the most part he kind of stays to himself getting it done for some reason it seemed like it was going a lot faster when i had been here but I'm not sure why. For some reason, <laughs> that 24 year old guy that knocks an out. <laughs> well, guys, I think that's going to be it for me. I've got to go in and cook dinner before I live video. I just wanted to take a quick little look around the farm with y'all. I have some really cool stuff to share this week. Some some different tips and information that I've been putting together. I just wanted to be able to do the videos justice. So, thank you for hanging out with me today. I bless you. Until next time.